Hi, this video is going to go over the library of functions as they are presented in section 1.5 of the pre-calculus text. Starting out with, we're going to look at linear functions briefly. We've spent a lot of time doing that already and you studied linear functions in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. If you look at the equation y plus mx plus b, m is the slope and y is the y-intercept. Now the domain, as far as uh, we're concerned is all the numbers that can be put into the equation. That's going to be all real numbers because there's no number that would cause problems if I put it in for x. The range is also going to be all real numbers. There will be um, one y-intercept at 0b and if m is positive that means the slope is positive and you should expect to see the slant going uphill like this from left to right. If the slope is negative, it should fall left to right. And the steeper the, the line, the greater the absolute value of the slope. So let's look at an example. When we graph a linear function, we look at the slope, which is this number right here, and we also look at the y-intercept, including its sign. So the slope is 2 thirds and the y-intercept is 0, negative 4. So on the y-axis we go down to negative 4 and then from there we're going to rise 2 and run 3 because slope represents the rise over the run. So we would rise 2, run 3, put our second point and then draw the line. There are two special kinds of linear functions. The first is called the constant function, and that's going to be of the form y equals a number. In this case, since it goes through the y-axis at negative 2, this equation is y equals negative 2. And again, remember that the line goes on forever in both directions. The second special type would be called the identity function, and that would be the line y equals x. So that means it's going to go through the point 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, etc. For quadratic functions, sometimes called the squaring functions, you get a u-shaped curve called the parabola. This also should be familiar because we did these just a little in Algebra 1 but quite a bit more in Algebra 2. As far as the statistics for those, the domain is going to be all real numbers. The range is going to be all real numbers greater than or equal to zero. The, the intercept will be the origin. It's going to be decreasing and then it will be increasing. There is always symmetry and the relative minimum is at zero, zero. So let's take a look at what that looks like. All right, here's the basic quadratic function. Now, we know that this parabola could be shifted around, turned upside down, stretched, and all those things. And we're going to look at that in the next week or two. But this is just the basic quadratic function, f of x equals x squared. So looking at the information that we just had on uh, the screen, notice a few things about this. All of the x values are used. There's a point that's goes with each x value on the x coordinate. However, the y values that are used are only the ones from 0 and up. There's no graph below the origin. The origin itself is the minimum point, so we say it's the relative minimum. And I have symmetry with respect to the y-axis. The right side of this parabola looks the same as the left side. All right, this next function is a little different than anything you've seen. It's new. It's called the greatest integer function. Notice that it has a little bit different uh, type of representation. It's got square brackets around the x. And now when you see that, what it means is whatever number you have in here, we want the greatest integer that's as big as x or equal to x. So, 
if the number's not an integer, then we want the integer to the left of that number on the, on the number line. And that's, that's the easiest way to explain it. Now, where this is used quite often are when, when something is built on um, chunks of time or intervals of time. Like, for instance, your phone bill. Your phone bill might be a base amount, and then um, for every minute or part of a minute, you get charged a certain rate. So it will take a fourth of a minute, and it will charge that at the same rate as a two-thirds of a minute. And then when it gets up to the full minute, then it hops up to the next rate. So you'll see what that looks like in just a second. Okay, let's look at just a, a few examples here. If you are looking for the greatest integer of 3, you look for 3 on the number line. And because that is an integer itself, the answer is actually 3. So the solution for this is 3. So the greatest integer of 6 would be 6. The greatest integer of 4 would be 4. Okay, now let's look at a decimal number. So you find 5.9 on the number line, which would be right about here. The greatest integer included in 5.9 would actually be 5. So the answer to this is 5. The solution is 5. Likewise, if I have the greatest integer of 1.7, the greatest integer is 1. The 0.7 is not large enough to get me to the next integer. The greatest integer of 9.9 .9 would be 9 because it's not quite 10. So those make sense. The, the ones that are difficult are when you have negative numbers. Now the integers are fine, easy to do. Um, I know that the greatest integer of negative 7 would be negative 7. But when you have a decimal or a fraction, then you have to, you have to be real careful. Because find negative 4.2 on the number line, and it's, you know, it's right about there. The greatest integer is the first integer to the left. So in this case, the greatest integer of negative 4.2 is going to be negative 5. It's a little counterintuitive. We, you don't just drop off and, and truncate the decimal part. You have to pick the integer on the number line directly to the left. So let's look at another one. Let's say I want the greatest integer of negative 2.8. You look on the number line, find negative 2.8 is right about there. Go to the left and the answer is negative 3. Okay, let's see what this looks like when we graph it. Okay, let's take a look at what the graph represents here. I put a table here with just a few values. So if I look at the point 1, the greatest integer in 1 is 1. The greatest integer of 1.2 is 1. The greatest integer of 1.5 is 1. The greatest integer of 1.7 is 1. The greatest integer of 1.9 is 1. So I'm going to continue to be on this little horizontal segment until I get to 2. When I get to 2, my graph jumps because the greatest integer of 2 is 2. So the way that I show that I'm going to include everything up to 2 but not including 2 is make that an open circle. From all the values between 2 and 3, I'm going to be along this line. But as soon as I get to 3, I have to jump up because the greatest integer of 3 is here. So my advice to you, when you graph a function that is a greatest integer function, get an idea of what it looks like up here in the positive section because these are the ones that make more sense. And then all you have to do is just continue to follow the pattern that you see down into the negatives. Okay, here are the eight most common functions. We've already noticed um, and talked about the constant function and the identity function, but we also have the absolute value function, the square root function, the quadratic function, 
the cubic function, the reciprocal function, and the greatest integer function, which we already just looked at as well. So let's look at the graphs of those other types. We've already talked about the constant function and the identity function, but again, here are the graphs of those. The constant function is a horizontal line. The identity function is the line y equals x. Here are the next two functions, the absolute value function and the square root function. Notice that for the absolute value function, the graph is always going to be a v. And for the square root function, the graph is actually going to be half of a sideways parabola. If we had the entire parabola, it would no longer be a function. So we only consider the positive square roots of x. Here are the next two functions. We've already looked at the quadratic function. We know it's a parabola. This one is called the cubic function because it has an x cubed. Cubic functions are odd functions because they have symmetry with respect to the origin. So y equals x cubed is, um, has symmetry with respect to the origin, so we call it an odd function. And this one, y equals x squared, is an even function because it has symmetry with respect to the y-axis. Now, not all quadratics are even, and not all cubics are odd. It depends on the actual equation and where it sits on the graph. The last two functions are the reciprocal function, which is f at x equals 1 over x. We get two branches, and they both hug the x-axis and the y-axis. And we'll look at more functions like that in uh, a week or two. And then the greatest integer function, we've already talked about that. That has a different kind of a notation there that you'll have to be aware of. And finally, the common functions that we've just talked about can be graphed on your graphing calculator if you know where to find them. The absolute value is in the math menu, and it's actually in the number menu of the math menu. So you push your math button and then hit the right arrow to highlight number and then you'll see AVS. That stands for absolute value. If you look down to the cubic function, it's also in the math menu as is the greatest integer function. The greatest integer function is in the same menu that absolute value is in, the number menu, and it's INT. Um, the other ones I think are pretty self-explanatory but uh, there you, you have them in, the, in your uh, notes, in the overhead notes, if you need to refer to them.